was last week, yes, last week where we set up um, from a word problem and then we drew it and then we solved it. So we're gonna, what I'm going to do today before I go on to sensitivity analysis is I'm going to show you that software that's going to help you just check your answers um, and draw the feasible regions as well. You still have to set up the equations and things, but it just gives you some way to check your work and do additional questions if you want to. So a reminder about this um, question, it was basically you have a travel agency and it wants to transport a minimum of 1,200 passengers and 36,000 kgs of luggage from one airport to another. And there were two types of aircraft available, the silver jet and the golden flyer. And your silver jet could transport 120 passengers and 2,000 kgs of luggage. And your golden flyer could transport 3,000 kgs of luggage and 60 people. And the travel agency is only allowed to use 16 aircraft for the little mission of transporting passengers and luggage. So one of the things that we did was we're like, okay, we know we want to minimize the cost because that was the main idea, the main goal. So we ended up with let X be the number of golden flyer. Oh, it's silver jet, my bad. Let's do it exactly like we did it in class. Let X be the number of silver jet. Would be useful pen work. There we go. Utilized. And let Y be the number of golden flyers. And remember we said we had to say let X be this and Y be that and let our users know about it because otherwise they, if they're looking at the mathematical problem, they won't know what the variables X and Y mean. Then we had minimize the cost, which was minimize C, which is a function of X and Y, the number of aircraft used, where we had the 40,000 Rand spent for every silver jet that we use, so 40,000 times X plus the 48,000 Rand for every golden flyer we use. So 48,000 Rand times the number of golden flyers. Then we had subject two. And we had in the first case, how many passengers, passengers each aircraft could take. So remember there were 120 passengers that the silver jet could transport per flight. So it was 120 times X plus the 60 that the golden flyers can transport times Y. And we had to at minimum transport 1,200 of them. So we wanted this to be greater than 1,200. And I don't have that much space so I can show it. So I'm just going to put a P there to remind you that it's passages. Then we had that the silver jet could transport 2,000 kgs of luggage. And again, you, Generally, we want to max out what you can transport because that's going to minimize your costs as well. You don't want to run an empty plane. So we have the 2,000 luggage there and the 3,000 for our golden flyer. Greater than equal to and was 36,000. And I'm just going to put an L there so you remember it. Then we had a situation of we could only use 16 aircraft. So we had X plus Y must be less than or equal to 16. So that's the limit of the aircraft. And we spoke about the fact that generally when we are using decision, decision variables and the units of something, you can't have negative people on negative aircraft. So you have X and Y must be greater than or equal to zero. And those are the non-negativity constraints. Okay, so that's what we built up last week. We also solved it. So now I'm going to show you how to just solve it using the software. So remember in class, we were like, listen, let's color in the parts that's not feasible. So we had that nice white clear region to read off for our feasible region. So what's going to happen here is if you use the Desmo software, 
You're going to see I actually have all the equations written, but I have these signs in the opposite direction. Because in Desmos, it colors in what is feasible. And again, that's just going to get a little bit messy. So to stop it being messy and to make sure that the non-feasible region is colored in, we just switch over the signs. So if you look there, I have 120x plus 60y, and I have less than equal to 1,200. And that's so when I do it like that, everything where it's not feasible is colored in. Okay. Then we have the 2,000x plus 3,000y greater than or equal to 36,000. Again, I just switched the sign so that my non-feasible region is colored in instead of my feasible region, just to make it easier for me to see my feasible region. And you just type it into Desmos like that. And you notice we can activate it. And we have our other line there, the 2000X plus 3000Y. Let me just do this quick. Then we have the X plus Y. And again, we just flip the sign so we have the non-feasible region colored in. And then you see there is the feasible region chilling there in the white region. Don't forget to do the non-negativity constraints. In this case, it's not going to be a big deal. But if we now go and make that screen a little bit bigger, you will see there sits the non-negativity constraints, that one over there and that one over there. So you can see they technically force it to be in the first quadrant. And here we have our feasible region sitting in that white clear region. So we don't have to check that all the colors are in the same spot for our feasible region. And now remember in the lecture, I was like, technically our objective function, our minimize or maximize is going to occur at the corner point. And I said, you could take your objective function and kind of like keep it parallel and just run it through. And it's going to touch the corner point once. Now in this, I'm actually going to show you how it works. So I'm going to put in my feasible region in orange. Um, I mean, my objective function orange. And you're going to watch me just slowly take it from the zero, zero point through until it reaches the feasible region. So you see, that's what I mean by you could use the ruler method to actually determine your objective function, minimize or maximize. So you see, I'm slowly moving it through. And you're going to see at that corner point, it touches it once. That means it's tangent to the feasible region. You don't have to worry too much about the word tangent, but that tangent is actually saying that it is at an optimal because it's only touching once. So the minimization would occur at that point where the purple and the green constraints coincide. So constraint one and two in this case. Then if you keep on going through, you'll notice it at the other corner point there, so it's currently crossing a corner point, but the objective function line is going through the feasible region. So that one is not optimal. So it must only touch the feasible region once, then it is at the optimal. So we can continue on. And the, that point over there, the one that we're going through at the moment, that one would be our maximum. So again, this is like the ruler method. We don't test you on the ruler method, but it's a nice thing to actually observe. And when we do the range of optimality, it'll make things make a little bit more sense. And where it touches the feasible region once, then that is an optimal point, either a minimization or a maximization. So there is an optimal point, and there is an optimal point. Obviously not fully accurate because I'm using a tablet to run the line through. So use Desmos to play around with it so you can get an idea of drawing feasible regions and how everything works. You can use it to practice drawing your lines. I strongly recommend it for it. But overall, that then tells us um, where optimals are. Another nice thing about it is if you click, you know, where it's the lines are intersecting, you will be able to read up the points. So you can also practice finding your um, simultaneous equation, your points of intersection, and then use Desmos to check it by just clicking on the points over there. So again, it's a really good tool to practice your work. Right, so let's go back now to 
our problem. One of the things we are going to do today is to look at sensitivity analysis. So remember when we did this, let's just make that a little bit bigger. When we did this, we actually showed that the optimal solution occurred at the point six and eight, which again, we just showed with the diagram. So we had the situation of the corner point, be used what my pen was working, there we go. C, it was C, yes, six and eight, was six to 4,000, and that was the optimal. And we did that by, you know, going through all those simultaneous equations to find those points. And that meant that we had six silver jets and eight golden flyers. Now, the thing is, if you're in a company uh, or, you know, in a consultant for a company, often you want to kind of know how you could fudge your constraints and your optimal solution values. So there's a range of sensitivity analysis that you can do. In this module, we're only actually going to cover what is referred to as the range of optimality. So let's just write that down. The range of optimality, which is also referred to as rho. And what it's going to do, it's going to be like, how much can we change the objective function? Wrong pen, I'm sorry. How much can we change the objective function? And I'll explain what I'm saying now. Contributions to the decision variables without changing the optimal solution. So in other words, okay, let me finish write this before I write the wrong thing. Optimal solution. So in the range of optimality, we like, okay, how much can we actually change the coefficients of our objective function? So remember our objective function was the cost C x, y, and we had the 40,000 x plus the 48,000 y. That should have another zero. What this is saying is how much can we actually alter this 40,000? So if the costs increase, up until what point can we use our current model? So when do we have to actually go ahead and redo everything and resolve the equation? So what's the leeway? on this cost, how much can we change it and still maintain the current optimal solution? And then there's also the situation of obviously, how much can we change this one? So what we do is we're actually gonna work out their ranges separately. So what we do is we assume that the one's always gonna stay the same, and then we find out the range of the other. So how much can we tweak it to still maintain this optimal solution here. So how much can we tweak those coefficients and still maintain the current optimal solution? Don't forget to tell me if I'm talking too fast or if you've lost your way or anything like that. So that's what we're going to investigate. Now to investigate this, we are actually going to have to think about we I spoke about the fact that the optimal solution is tangent, tangent to the feasible region. That's going to play a gigantic role in why this theory works. So we're going to go back to our diagram and we are going to actually see what can we move around that will maintain the six and eight tangent to the feasible region. Again, tangent just means it touches it once. It doesn't cross through it in multiple locations. So we're going to go back to Desmos because it's a really cool way to show you what's happening. And I'm just going to change my example here quick. I did give you the link for this as well. So let's just make this a little bit bigger. Now, again, remember I said 
our objective function, we move that objective function. And where it's tangent, that's where the optimal is. Again, obviously I'm not being exact here. It's just see if I can change it here quick. There we go. So it's where it's tangent at that point, that's six and eight. That's where the optimal solution is. Now we're like, hey, how can we change that orange line? Because remember, the orange line is what the 40,000 and the 48,000 features in. It's what's causing that orange line to be that orange line. How can we change that orange line and still maintain it to be tangent at that point? So to make our lives a little bit easier, what we're going to do is there we have the orange line. Just a little bit messed up at the moment. Let's just put it back into place. And I have it as the black line at the moment on your screen. Let me just move it around a bit so you can just gather what way we're going with this. So that is going to be our objective function. But right now we're messing with the 40,000 and the 48,000. So we're messing with the A and B coefficients of that straight line, which ends up messing with the gradient. So you'll notice the, if the gradient moves at this moment now, it is no longer an optimal because it's cutting through the feasible region more than once. It's not tangent to the feasible region. Now, if I move it backwards, the moment it touches that purple line, it's tangent to the feasible region again because technically it's only touching that feasible region once. So in between that purple line and then we go around, that green line is where it's still going to only be tangent to the feasible region. So it only touches it once, it's not going to go through it. Okay, so we actually have a boundary there. We have the purple line and the green line are going to give us conditions on how far we can actually change the gradient of our objective function to still have that six and eight point to be the, um, the optimal solution. So that purple line and that green line is what's holding objective function and keeping it so that that six and eight is still optimal. The gradients of the purple line and the gradients of the green line. So let's go and just quickly draw that so you can see it. Slide this over into the wrong direction, but let's just go with it. So again, we want to find out how much we can change when we have CXY to AX plus BY, how much we can change A while leaving B as the 48,000 and still have that C68 as optimal. So we know that that optimal point, that C6 and 8, was created, uh, my bad, there we go, was created by this equation 120 plus 60y, so that's equation 1 over there, the p equation, and the green equation. So that is 2000x plus 3000y, the L equation. So we know that it is created by those two equations. So the gradients of those two equations is what is going to contain and how much we are allowed to change our objective functions coefficients and still keep that six and eight as an optimal solution. So let's just rewrite that optimal. And it was created by the P equation and the L equation. So the P equation and the L equation are creating the bounds for how much we can change our A coefficient. 
So AX plus 48,000Y. So what happens is we will always keep one of them stable and only look at the other one. The reason being is we are going to actually rewrite them as lines and their gradients. So let's do that first and then we can discuss it more because I think it will make a little bit more sense if we do it like that. Let's move that away so we have space. So we have the P equation, right? That is, wait, before I do the P equation, my bad. Let's do the cost equation first. So we have the cost equation is X and Y. And then you have the original was 40,000 X plus 48,000 Y. We now are looking at it as if we want to mess with the coefficients. So we want to mess with the 40,000 and the 48,000. So we're going to first just write them as A and B so we can do the working out. Now, if we write them as A and B, we are going to change the subject of the formula so that Y is the subject of the formula. So we're going to have Y is equal to minus A upon B, X plus C upon B. And if you're confused at where that's happening, think of it as C is equal to AX plus BY. Then we're going to have, you know, we want Y by itself. So we're going to have minus AX plus C is equal to BY. Then we're going to divide through by B. So we're going to have Y is equal to minus A upon B. And I've just made Y on my left-hand side to be more comfortable with it, plus C upon B. We don't care about this part here. We're only going to care about this part here because it was the gradients that are keeping it bounded for our optimal. So we're going to look at this part. But remember, the gradients of our purple line and our green line were the ones that were keeping, that required this gradient to be in between. So we have to go look at what the gradients of the purple line and the green line are. So let's have a look at that first. So we've worked out for our cost function. Now let's work out for P. And a reminder that our P equation was 120 X plus 60 Y. And let's just quickly show you the Desmos of it so you can remind yourselves what's happening. Uh, if I knew what my Desmos was, okay, there we go. 120 X plus 60 Y. And remember it was greater than or equal to 1,200. Desmos, we just changed it for the coloring in purposes. So, greater than or equal to 1,200. And we're going to do the same thing that we did with our cost function here where we have the A and B, except we can leave the coefficients as is because we're not changing those coefficients. So, we're just going to make Y the subject of the formula. So, technically, we already did this in the last lecture, but let's just go through it again you'll have 60y greater than or equal to minus 120x plus 1,200. So y is greater than or equal to minus 2. 120 divided by 60 gives you 2. Plus 1,200 divided by 60 is going to be 20. So the gradient here for this line is minus two. So this is going to be one of the bounds on the gradient in our cost function. So it has to be bounded. It can't go further than that minus two. Let's do the luggage one as well, because remember the luggage one was also one that bounded it. So let's just write it with y, the subject of the formula. So we have the 2000x plus the 3,000y, greater than or equal to 36,000. And again, we're going to make y the subject of the formula here. So 3,000y, greater than or equal to minus 2,000x plus 36,000. 
there. So y is going to be greater than or equal to minus uh, 3 upon 2, 2 upon 3, sorry, x plus 12. And this gradient here is also going to bound that cost function. So a reminder what I'm saying with that is, let's just once again get the decimals to come across. Close enough. The objective function, to make sure that it's tangent to the feasible region, it can't go over the gradient of the purple line. Let's highlight the purple line quick. So I'm going to highlight it now. There we go. So it can't go over the gradient of that purple line. If it goes further than the gradient of the purple line, it is no longer tangent to the feasible region. And it can't go over the green line. So that black line region needs to be between the gradient of the purple line and the gradient of the green line. So it can't go any further than that. It has to be between those two gradients, which is why we're working out those gradients. Okay. So now we have those two gradients. We have P's gradient is minus 2, and L's gradient is minus 2 upon 3. Then we have our objective function's gradient. So the gradient of the objective function, I'm just using M because gradient is usually responded as M in your schoolwork, but that gradient is actually minus A upon B. So just remember that we did work it out. It's coming from this here. And our objective function gradient must be between minus 2 and minus 2 upon 3. Now, when you're writing this out, you just need to consider your number line. So remember in your number line, and I know because it's negative numbers, it may get a bit confusing, but you're going to have a case of this is going to be minus 2, and then somewhere around here is going to be minus 2 upon 3. So the order of it, technically minus 2, is smaller than minus 2 upon 3. So when you want your objective function's range, you're going to have m of your objective function. It must be greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to the other. It has to be greater than the smallest one. So the smallest one here is the minus 2. And it has to be less than or equal to the biggest one. So that's going to be the minus 2 upon 3. So we have a range that the gradient of the objective function can be in to maintain that optimal solution that we had of 6 and 8. Again, if there's any questions, don't forget to type them. I'm just basing this on, you know, the limits of emic back I will get today. So we have this fact that that objective function is going to be, need to be between this minus two and this minus two upon three. And that the objective function equation is minus a, would be useful with my pen work, there we go, minus a upon b. So we still have that. Now we're finally at the point where we will find the ranges of our coefficient for our x and the range for the coefficient for the y. We're going to have to be very careful about this. So right now we have the range that the objective function's gradient can be to maintain that optimal solution of 6 and 8. So I'm going to scroll through to a clear page and just write that down for us for a second. The minus 2 less than or equal to minus a upon b less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3. Okay, clean page. Let's work with what we have now. Just a quick reminder, our CXY, the original one, was 40,000. X plus 48,000 Y. And we wrote it as AX plus BY. Okay, now a reminder that when we made y the subject of the formula, we did it for all of them. So just maintain that structure when you do the working out. So now we have that objective functions gradient sits there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to be like, 
we want to just test how much we can change variable A. If we want to test how much we can change variable A, let me write it down. Then we're going to set B as the original value that we had. So we're going to set B as that 48,000. So we're not changing B. So we set it as the 48,000. And then we're going to solve for the range that A can be. So we know that the objective function's range must be between the two constraints that give us that objective function's value, that optimal solution's value. That was that minus 2 and that minus 2 upon 3. And now we're like, okay, let's investigate how much we can change one of those coefficients. So we keep the one coefficient as the old value, the one that we started off with, and then we're just going to solve that missing coefficient's value. So we're going to be just replace it like this. And then we're going to solve for the A which means we have to obviously multiply through by 48,000 on both sides. So minus 2 times 48,000, less than equal to minus A, less than equal to minus 2.3 times 48,000. And then we're going to have to obviously get rid of that minus sign because we want the range of A, not the range of minus A. To get rid of the minus sign, we're going to multiply through by minus 1. And remember, when we multiply through by minus 1, these signs change direction. So we're going to have plus 2, 48,000. That is 48, I'm sorry. Greater than or equal to, because again, it's being multiplied by a negative number. Greater than or equal to. And 2 upon 3, 48,000. And at this point, we will obviously simplify our values. So we're going to have 96,000 here. I think my math is correct. Less than equal to A and 32,000. So now we know that if we keep, let's write this all down. If we keep 48,000Y, then A can go to as small as 32,000 and as big as 96,000 before we have to solve everything from scratch. Resolve our equation or our model. So we can actually and if we change the cost of hiring the silver jets to 95,000, we will still end up with a minimized cost using the six silver jets and eight golden flyers. So we have this range that if you know inflation happens and the flights, the value of the aircraft to hire it out increases, up until the point it costs 96,000, we can still use the solution we've just worked out. If it goes above 96,000, we're going to have to redo our entire model and resolve it. So the range of optimality just gives you some leeway so that you know you don't have to keep on working it out every time something changes. And you can plan in advance. So you'll be able to see like when things are increasing, when what do I need to do? Now, let's also just solve for B because when it's a denominator, it can get a bit confusing. So let's just clear our page. And again, we have that minus 2 less than equal to minus a upon b less than equal to minus 2 upon 3. So we still have that. We still know that our cxy is ax plus by. And we still know our original values were 40,000 x and 48,000 y. But now we want to solve for b. 
So there's a couple of ways that you can actually go ahead and solve your ranges for B. I'm just going to do it the standard long approach at first and go from there. So when we want to solve for B, we set A as our old value. So we're going to have minus 2 less than or equal to minus 40,000. And B sits over there, less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3. And I'm going to separate these two equations. So I'm going to look at this equation, and then I'm going to look at this equation separately. So let me just write that out. 40,000 B, and then I'm going to have minus 40,000 B over here, less than or equal to minus 2 upon 3. So I've just separated those two to make it a little bit easier to do the working out because we're going to have to solve for B again. Now we can multiply through by B. We know that B is going to be positive all the time, so the signs are not going to change when we multiply through by B. And it won't be zero because otherwise we have a badly made model. So we're going to have minus 2 times B is less than or equal to minus 40. Thousand, and we can do the same on the other side. So we'll have minus forty thousand is less than or equal to minus two upon three b. So all I've done is I've multiplied through by b. I know my b is positive. That's why I can do this. And again, I know my b is positive because it's a financial value of renting it. So that that's why it, it's not going to be a negative value. They're not going to pay us to use the aircraft. Now we're going to continue our solving for through with B as the subject of the formula. So we're going to divide through by the minus 2. So less than or equal to, wait, we're multiplying through by minus 2, so the sign needs to change. So that's going to be greater than or equal to. We're going to have that minus 40,000 and the minus 2. So that's going to give us 20,000. So again, the sign changed because I multiplied through by minus 2. Then we're going to do it on the other side as well. This side's a little bit more complicated because we have that situation of 3 upon 2. So we're going to have minus 40,000 times by minus 3 upon 2. You can do it the long way. So you can actually say, um, multiplied by 3 and then divided by 2. That's perfectly okay. I'm just going to just follow the approach of if I know there's a fraction, I just invert the fraction and multiply it. And the sign changes as well because, again, there was a sign change involved in the multiplication. So that's going to become greater than or equal to B. And now if we do the working out here, 40,000 divided by 2 gives us 20,000. 20,000 times by 3 gives us 60,000. So 60,000 greater than or equal to B. Now we have to combo that into a range like the A range. So remember, if B must be greater than 20,000 but less than 60,000, how are we going to write that? So we can write it like this. B is greater than 20,000 and less than 60,000. When you're filling in your information, just be very careful on the order of this and write down your information in the correct way. But again, the interpretation of this is that our cost of our golden flyers, if our silver jets remain 40,000, can change between the range of 20,000 and 60,000 to maintain the optimal solution of the six and the eight. So the six silver jets and the eight golden flyers. If it goes above that 60,000 or below that 20,000, we have to redo our model and resolve for it. But if it's in this range and the silver jets values don't change, then the optimal solution will remain that six and eight point, and we don't have to do any working out, additional working out. And that is 